Well, good morning, Dallas Church. Will you stand with us as we begin our service today? Good morning. Uh, welcome to Dallas Church, all of our uh, onliners and all of our building people too. It's good to be together. We are thrilled today to have Dr. Ben Williams from Boise Bible College here to continue our Torah series. Um, if you're new with us today, please reach out to your online chat host and say hello. Uh, or if you're here in the building as the service wraps up, go visit uh, David at our connection table. He's got a, a welcome gift for you. Let's pray and, uh, and be the church together today. Lord Jesus, 
thank you that we can come together as free people to worship you. Uh, thank you, God, that we can dig into the Old Testament and have it bring, uh, bring new teaching and new life to our hearts and ears. Lord, just help us to focus in with you today as we spend this time together, uh, worshiping, listening, learning, and, and being in fellowship together. In Jesus' name, amen.
turn it around, God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. As was mentioned, my name is Ben Williams, and I am from Boise Bible College, and I am glad to be here. Something you say a lot when you're visiting someplace, I'm glad to be here. I really am glad to be here for a couple of reasons. We like to talk about partnering with churches at the Bible College, and often you hear about things the church sends to us, things like students and finances, most importantly, your prayers. Those things are crucial. Thank you for those. But today, can I say thank you for the other side of the partnership? Thank you for letting me come here. Thank you for letting me do this, that we can do this together. I am glad to do that. I'm glad to partner with this church. I was last here in February where your preaching team was working through the minor prophets. And now we're working through the Torah. I respect a staff and a preaching team willing to take those things on, and I think that you can handle the material. Glad to be part of that. But as I just mentioned, I was last here in February, and I don't know if you noticed, a few things happened since last February. More specifically, a lot didn't happen, because after I was here last February, I stopped traveling. It's good to be back with you again. So we have finished up the school year at Boise Bible College, and it has been a long, hard school year, and some of you can relate very well to how hard things have been. But now that school year is over, we're into summer, and that means for me I am into summer house projects. This summer it is painting. One of my daughters will graduate next Saturday, and so the house had to be painted on the inside before people came over. Kitchen. Dining room, living room, all one open area. That is attached to three hallways, so there are 11 doorways to paint around. So, I went to Home Depot and I got the supplies. I first went four or five times and got the samples until my wife picked the color she wanted. Then she picked the color she wanted, and I went and I bought five gallons of paint, and I bought rollers, and I bought cheap brushes, and I'm messy, so I bought drop cloths. And somebody talked me into buying a good edging brush to go around all of those doorways and the baseboards and the ceilings. I still don't have a steady hand, so I also bought three rolls of the blue tape. And by God's grace, a week later, that project was done, and I think it looks pretty good. One of the reasons is because I bought the right tools. I could have used duct tape instead of the blue tape, but that would have just led to more painting projects. A hammer, a screwdriver are very effective tools, but not when it comes to making nice, clean painting edges. They're not designed for that. I could have used a cheap sponge brush with yesterday's paint dried on it, and I never would have gotten a clean edge around all of that trim that way. The right tools absolutely matter. Tools are designed to be used a certain way. So in my house, my tools are not always very well organized. I blame the kids. It's not always their fault, but most of the time it's their fault. So I'll be in the middle of a project and I know I have the right tool, the tool designed for this job. How do I know I have it? I bought it the last time I did a similar job. So I go to my garage to get the tool and I can't find it. So then I look in my toolbox and I grab a different tool that's kind of close and I think it might work. And I don't know if you've ever done this, but for me that ends up going back and forth between the house and the garage four or five times and it doesn't work. 
And by this point, a couple of hours have passed, and I'm frustrated, and I could have just stopped and gone to the store, spent $5 on the right tool designed for this job. The job would be done, and I would be less frustrated. Tools have a specific design. They are so helpful when they are used the right way. Today we're going to spend some time looking at the book of Genesis. And I hope you will see a couple of key points as we do that. All under this one idea that God wants to bless His creation. God wants to bless His creation. God designed the world. He created the world and everything in it. He created the world and everything in it. He knows what He wants. He's got a design for how it is supposed to work. And if we do things His way, they work better. The biblical word for all of this is blessed. We learn much about this design and blessing from the book of Genesis. Now, there's a lot of controversy around the book of Genesis, and I want to speak to that just a little bit. I'll give you my thoughts in a few minutes. But let me just start by saying I believe the book of Genesis. I believe that it primarily contains factual information. And I believe that because I have studied. But the big thing I want us to see, in spite of all the controversy, is that God wants to bless His creation. God has created the world. He has a design. And if we do things according to His way and His design, we are blessed. This series is called The Law Leading to Jesus. And Genesis is the origin story of God's people. And it's the origin story of so much more. It is, in fact, the origin story of everything. It's the backstory of all of history, which is, in fact, His story, the history of Jesus. All of this in Genesis is, in fact, going to point us to Jesus. My hope today is that you will have an understanding of the design, and I hope that you will see that much of human history is a result of us not following the design. And Jesus is the way that God turns it around and makes it right. Now, in Genesis, there are lots of names and controversy, but hopefully this will give you the courage to be willing to dive into that book because I believe that you can, in fact, handle it. In order to do that, I want to focus on three unique creations from the book of Genesis. God created the world, He created humans, and He created a nation. First, God created the world. I'm going to be taking a broad view of Genesis. If you want to flip back and forth in your Bible, that's fine. But it might be easier for you today if you just listen or follow along on the screen. The first words in your Bible say, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I love creation. In the past week, I have seen most of the state of Idaho and most of the state of Oregon. I've seen mountains and deserts and rivers and rocks and trees. Drove all the way across Oregon yesterday. I've seen trees, and they're beautiful. But I've also seen in the last week, I've seen deer and elk and sandhill cranes. And Friday morning, I saw a blonde bear cub. I love God's creation. I've seen clouds, and I've seen stars. Creation is wonderful. I'm so thankful I have gotten to experience so much of God's creation. But I got to thinking about that bear I saw. That bear is going to live its life in the mountains south of Baker City, Oregon. And I wonder how many people that bear will see or will see that bear. Probably not very many. The Psalms tell us that creation is for God's pleasure. But in His pleasure, He's allowed us to see it. And I'm very thankful for that. He allowed me to enjoy that. Genesis 2 says it this way, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God finished His work that He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. 
because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. I actually believe that God did this in seven days. And I believe that for two reasons. One, I believe the Bible tells us that God is that powerful. He is the creator God who can do this on his time frame. And this is the way he chose to have it written down. I don't want to ignore science. I don't want to pretend it doesn't exist. But I do want to admit that sometimes there are assumptions at play as well. But that's not the important point I want to make today. The important thing is that the world is God's creation. He designed it however he chose to do so. The way he wants it to work is according to his design. And last week you heard Pastor Ben say he created it good. The Hebrew word is tov. He put the planets and the stars in existence and he set them in motion in a way that gives us seasons and years and gives us a seven-day week. And in the process of doing that, there's that word again, bless. He designed a system with a holy day, you might say holiday, that he blessed for us to enjoy and rest. It is his day. From all of the design, I hope that we will see when we do things God's way, we get to experience God's blessing. God created and designed this world for our blessing. And in the process of that creation, he created something very special. God created the world, and second, God created humans. Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. By the way, that is plural because Jesus is there. And John chapter 1 says that for us. It's going to show up in one of the songs we're going to sing in a little bit. But humans are created in God's image. And this creature is unique and special and extraordinary and wonderful. I consider myself a bit of a wordsmith. I fight with my students to choose the best word. And in this case, I can't do it. So I'm piling up the words on this creature because humans are that special. The world is amazing. The world is awesome. But only humans bear God's image. Now let me read the rest of that verse with the verses around it. Then God said, Let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Yes, there is some repetition here because those things are important. Humans are created in God's image and according to these verses, humans are created to rule the world. There is much in current thought that says we are sinning against the world with our carbon footprint. I think it would be more accurate to say when we sin against God, we damage the world he has created. Let me say it this way. The world is created for us, not the other way around. And that changes our perspective because humans are God's special creation. And therefore, humans are to rule over the world. Should we take care of it? Absolutely. Because it is God's creation. But he created it for people, not the other way around. Third thing I want to say about humans. The creation design of humans includes gender. I could talk about this for a long time, but I'm supposed to do something at noon today, so I, I better not spend too much time on it. But let me just read a couple of verses. I just read one about blessing from chapter 1. In Genesis 5, 
we read this phrase, male and female, he created them and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. Genesis 5 is going to be this long list of names from the early centuries after creation. And just in case we missed it, when we get to that history of people, that genealogy, here is a reminder. Men and women are created in God's image, and that is the key to blessing. So Genesis 1 is going to go through the six days of creation with broad details. A couple of quick insights about what happens each day, and then Genesis 2 is going to focus in. Last week, Pastor Ben said that sometimes the text will zoom out. That's chapter 1. And in chapter 2, he zooms in on this most special creation. People, humans, men and women created in God's image and likeness. And then we come to this verse, and you may ask why this verse, and I'll tell you why. Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. They're created, male and female. And the design is, they will leave parents, they will be joined together and create a new family. God's creation design for man and woman in marriage. And this is part of God's perfect creation design. Why this verse? Not because of any current controversy, but because this verse is so important in the New Testament. So a group comes to Jesus and is asking about divorce, and instead he answers about marriage by quoting this verse from Genesis. The Apostle Paul is talking to the church in Ephesians, and he says, the church is like a marriage. Christ in the church is like husband and wife. And he quotes this verse from Genesis. In another place, in Timothy, Paul is talking about church leadership and how it works with gender roles, and he quotes this verse from Genesis. Here's my point. Thousands of years after Genesis, in the New Testament, in talking about how people work together, they keep going back to God's creation design for men and women. You can try to use a rock or an axe to loosen a bolt. But that is not what those tools are designed for. Blessing comes when creation functions according to design. And all of this creation comes before there is sin. All of this creation in chapters 1 and 2, including how humans were created to interact with each other, is before sin enters the world. There is a design for it. God is so good. He wants the best for us. And then we get to chapter 3, and things change. In chapter 3, we, the special creation, messes up all of creation. There's a story of a serpent and fruit and a tree, and it tells us how sin enters the world. So the rest of the Bible and the rest of history is a result of doing things our way instead of God's way, and that is called sin. You don't paint with a hammer. You don't cut paper with a wrench. But we misuse creation all the time, especially in our interactions with the only creatures created in God's image. And we wonder why things are hard. And God's going to continue to intervene so that we can have blessing. The song we just sang, God continues to turn it around. But when we sin, when we do it our way, it makes it so much harder. God wants us to have blessing. The opposite of that is curse. Let me say a couple things about the curse in Genesis 3. I'm not going to read most of it to you. First thing is, it's our fault. The reason things are messed up is because we didn't do things according to God's design. And in that process, there's a curse. But if you read the text carefully, the serpent is cursed, the ground is cursed, and all of that will affect the special creation, humans. But the man and the woman are not cursed. That word doesn't show up with them, it shows up in how it affects 
them. I'll let you read that on your own. There's a design for a blessing, but our sin leads to a curse. The book of Romans in the New Testament tells us that all of creation is affected by that. In fact, I would argue that the reason there are things like earthquakes and hurricanes are a result of the fact that we sinned and messed up creation more so than anything else. God designed the world. God designed men and women, and there is so much blessing here. So when we use the term hashtag blessed, even if we're not getting that quite right, we're hinting at God wanted us to do it a certain way, and when that happens, we receive blessing. We only find blessing when we do things the way they were designed. God is the blesser. God is the designer. It only works when we do it his way. And man and woman mess this up. And it leads to cursing and also a promise. A promise of blessing. From the day they mess it up, there is a promise to turn things around. Verse 15 of Genesis 3 says, I will put enmity between you, talking to the serpent, and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Spoiler alert, that's about Jesus. Where have we been? God sets it all up. He gives it to people. We mess it up. And here there is a hint of promise and that's about Jesus. Last week, Pastor Ben called Jesus the snake crusher. Jesus is the way that will make things right. I want to very briefly take a detour from the book of Genesis and talk about some controversy. Over the next few chapters, after we get through Genesis 3 and 4, there's going to be a list of names, and some of those people are going to live for over 900 years. By we get to chapter 6, we're going to get a story about Noah and a flood. And then in chapter 11, you'll get a story about the Tower of Babel. There are a bunch of questions about the book of Genesis. If you want to know more details about this, bring me a cup of coffee later and we'll talk through it. But let me just summarize this way. There are names in the book of Genesis that many will claim are just myth. Names like Adam and Noah. But I want to say that the New Testament refers to these people as if they are historical figures and not just stories. I'm not going to go into all the detail, but that's one of the things that helps me understand what is going on. Read Romans 5 sometime. It gives you a lot of detail about the man Adam and the man Jesus. But there's a summary in 1 Corinthians 15.22. I don't think this is in your notes, but if you want to look this up later, you can. 1 Corinthians 15.22 says this, For as in Adam all die, so as in Christ all will be made alive. Okay, biblically, theologically. Jesus dying on the cross is what saves sinners. Jesus is an actual historical figure who actually died on a cross at a certain time, in a certain place. So my logical assumption is, there is a man named Adam and a woman named Eve who are actual historical figures who had an incident at a certain time and place with a snake and a tree. That makes the most logical sense. And in fact, these names are often paired with others that we know without a doubt are historical figures. You don't have to agree with me on these things. The church, the Catholic church, mainline denominations do not have an official position on several of the things I just said because people who love Jesus disagree about these issues. All I have done is give you my opinion as one who has studied them. I don't think they are merely myths. As to creation, Hebrews chapter 11, where we have a bunch of these names, some of which we know are historical figures, as to creation, it says, by faith, we understand the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. How do we understand that? By faith. Quick summary to simply say, I believe most of the book of Genesis is factual information. 
and I have not seen enough evidence to convince me otherwise. You don't have to agree with me on that. The big point I want you to see is that God created it with a design. So having said that, let me move to the third thing that God creates. He creates a nation. He creates a nation. Why did I talk about the controversy? Because Genesis ch chapters 1 through 11, there's a lot of controversy. It's ancient, very ancient history. How do we know whether these things happened? But by the time we get to chapter 12, everybody agrees these historical events happened. We meet a man by the name of Abraham. And today, in the world, billions of people who adhere to some form of Jewish, Christian, or Islamic faith all trace their roots back to this man, Abraham. And scholars who don't believe any of those three religions believe that there was a man named Abraham who is a historical figure who changes culture drastically in his time and for all time. 50 or 100 years ago, not everybody agreed that Abraham was a historical figure. Now the evidence is overwhelming again. My thought is this. What about the first 11 chapters? I think they're probably fact as well. Here's what I want to say about Abraham, and then we'll get into God's creation of a nation. Abraham spoke to God 2,000 years before Jesus. Abraham lived as long before Jesus as you do after Jesus. The events of the Torah do not take place at the same time as the events of the cross. There's a lot of history that happens there. So let's review. God creates the world. It is amazingly designed. In the process, he creates special creatures, humans, and we mess it up, even though we're created in God's image. We live in a damaged world. We were designed to take care of it. Instead, we damaged it, and I think we continue to do that. But in spite of that, God still wants to bless us like he originally designed. From the moment we mess things up, God has been at work setting in place the process to turn it around, to make it all right, and his name is Jesus. So in Genesis 12, after this backstory, we meet an individual and we see God's plan set in motion. The rest of the Bible is about God's plan and humans straying from that plan. In Genesis 12, we read these words. Now the Lord said to Abram, later he'll be called Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. Did you catch that word? God creates a covenant with Abraham. A covenant is kind of like a contract, but God is the one who holds all the cards. He designed it. He gets to decide how it works. Last week, Pastor Ben said a covenant is more about life than it is about property and sacrifice. And I thought that was so good, so helpful. This covenant, you're going to find out next week, includes rules. The rules are part of the design. They've always been part of the design. But if you look at this screen, do you know what word is much bigger than the word rules? The word bless. The point of the covenant is not to restrict you to rules, it is to bless you. The rules serve to lead to the blessing. That is the way it was designed. So God chooses Abraham. He wants to bless him with a place. He wants to bless him with descendants and turn those descendants into a nation. And that nation will be called the nation of Israel. And all of that is to be a conduit of God's blessing to whom? Everybody. 
This text, it says, all the families of the earth. Later, it's going to say, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through this process. God created it. We messed it up. God puts in place a covenant so that we can still experience blessing. And all of that points to Jesus. God created a nation known as Israel so all nations can be blessed. I want to quickly say, because I don't want to avoid the world around us, in recent weeks, the current nations of Israel and Palestine have started bombing each other again. They do this a lot. Part of those problems are rooted in the book of Genesis, in the covenant with Abraham, and not doing things God's way. I will say, a lot of those problems are based on political decisions made over the past hundred years. But there are some roots in Genesis. There are some doing things not God's way that lead to a curse and people not getting along with each other because they're not doing things the way God designed. So the nation of Israel is created. The rest of the Old Testament is about the nation of Israel. It's about how this nation interacts with God and how this nation interacts with other nations. So you get to the New Testament. The New Testament is about the nation of Israel. More specifically, it's about the king of Israel. In fact, your New Testament opens with these words. It's a genealogy, and it tells us about Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. It says he is the descendant of Abraham, whom was given this promise of blessing. And he is the descendant of David, who is the king of this nation of Israel. Jesus is the king, who is the promised, the blessing, and he is the conduit for all to have blessing. And in fact, many places in the New Testament says that we are part of that nation if we know Jesus. Read 1 Peter 2.9 at some point later today. We're almost done. Not quite. One of the things Abraham was promised was descendants. So a couple of details, and then we'll wrap up. The rest of the book of Genesis, once we get to chapter 12, is about the descendants of Abraham. We call them the patriarchs. Abraham has sons named Isaac and Ishmael. Two sons is not according to God's design. They have problems. We're still seeing some of those problems. But Isaac is the son of the promise and the son of the covenant. Isaac has a son named Jacob, or he's going to be renamed Israel. That's where we get the name of the nation. He's going to have 12 sons who will roughly become 12 tribes in a nation of Israel, and that sets up the entire history of the Old Testament. Jacob is going to have one son of the 12 whose name is Joseph. And at the end of the book of Genesis... Joseph is going to take all of his brothers and his father and all of their families and he is going to move them from this promised land into Egypt and the book of Genesis is going to close. While they are in Egypt, they are going to grow. The book of Genesis closes and there is 400 years until the book of Exodus opens. 400 years is a long time. 400 years is as long as from us back to the pilgrims. 400 years is the distance between the Old Testament and the New Testament. During that time in Egypt, they're going to multiply from a few dozen to about 2 million people who are a nation. And during that entire time, fathers are going to pass down to sons and grandsons. There is a promise of blessing according to God's design, if we do things God's way. And you open up the book of Exodus, and they will be set up to receive that blessing. The Old Testament is so long because they don't do it right. And we don't either. Think about it this way. I want you to imagine you are 16 years old, and you are given a job by your boss or even worse, by your dad. Dad says, I want you to paint the house. And he gives you a pressure washer, and he gives you a paint sprayer, and he hands you the instruction manuals, 
and says, I'm leaving for a week. When I get back, I want the house painted. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was 16, I didn't like to read instruction manuals. Still don't. So the kid wants to clean off the house so he can get it painted, and so he gets a pressure washer, and it takes him a while to figure it out. He fiddles with it, and he's spraying, and, and he's getting all wet, but he's not doing much good. He's not getting anything off the house. So he goes and fiddles with it more, and he gets lots of power. I don't know if you've ever used a pressure washer with lots of power. But he's getting the paint off. And he's also getting other things off, taking chunks out of the house and gouges out of the house and accidentally hits mom's flower bed. They're gone. Just taking things out. So he finally gets done and he, he moves to the paint sprayer and he's trying to figure out this thing and it's just kind of spitting everywhere and finally gets it figured out and, but doesn't quite figure out how to get straight lines but he paints the whole house with the paint sprayer. And he gets done and he steps back and looks at his work and, huh, I don't know if I was supposed to paint the windows green or not. And there's overspray on the fence, and there's also a lot of green spots on Dad's shiny 57 Chevy. He had the manuals designed to use these tools that would make this job very easy, but he chose to do it his way. That's the Old Testament. That's the entirety of the Old Testament. And God keeps stepping in and says, I want to turn it around. I want to turn it around. Is that not the picture of our lives? Here's a design. Yeah, but I don't really want to do it that way. That way sounds hard. But the design will lead to blessing. Three things I want you to walk away with today. God has designed creation for our blessing. And if you understand that principle, I think you can dive into the book of Genesis and understand what God intended. I hope that you are reminded that we will only receive that blessing when we are doing things God's way. So when you think about rules, remember there is a design. God has a reason. He wants things to work this way. And if we do it that way, we can be blessed. But if you ever stand back and look at the house and the paint mess you've made, and that's your life, remember that God still wants to bless you, and it is only possible because of Jesus. So when you sing the songs this morning, maybe we can truly praise Jesus who makes that blessing possible. Please let me pray for you. God, you are so good, and we believe that your creation is good. And I thank you for the people you have created. Would you remind us this week that you want us to do things well? You want us to treat each other well as bearers of your image? Would you remind us that that is possible because of Jesus? And may we live in his name. Amen. As we journey through the writings of Moses together, we very quickly see that our God is a God of promise and of covenants. That God wants to bless people that put faith in the promises and covenants that he gives to them. In Genesis, we see sin entering into the world through the interaction of Adam, Eve, and the serpent. And shortly after, God makes a promise that through the offspring of Eve, there would be one that would crush the head of the serpent. One of Adam and Eve's descendants, Abraham, is also given a promise by God that through his offspring, all of the nations of the world would be blessed. These promises are fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. Through Jesus, we have an everlasting promise and covenant that frees us from the power of sin and death and restores us back into relationship with God. Jesus reminds us to remember this covenant by taking bread that represents his body that was given for us and by drinking wine that represents his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus has made a promise and a covenant with us that if we put our faith and trust in him, he will forgive our sins. As we reflect on this this morning, 
we respond by putting our trust in God through the work and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We do that by prayer and contemplating these things. We take communion, we give, and we serve. If you've been feeling led to give today, you can do so by putting a gift in one of the giving boxes up here by the communion table. You can also go to dallaschurch.org, the Church Center app, or mail a check to the P.O. box. If serving has been on your heart, we'd love to have that conversation with you. You can come by the connection table, or you can fill out one of the Next Step cards. Let's take the next few moments to pray and respond to what God has for us as we continue with our worship together. Hurting or broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bound with the precious blood of Jesus Sticks. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and treat them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to. was 
All right. Well, it's been so good to be together today. Again, if you are new with us, would you come on by the connection booth out here? Say hi to David. He has got a welcome gift for you. And then just a couple more quick things going on this week around Dallas Church. First, we are uh, uh, thrilled again. Uh, Dr. Ben Williams, after the, the sermons this morning, he is going to teach at lunchtime with us here starting in about 15 minutes and continue to help us learn to teach the Old Testament. So we're going to kind of go deeper with this Torah uh, teaching and, and get some more practical tips at lunchtime. You are all invited to come and join us for that. If you can make it, uh, uh, grab a, a quick uh, word together and some fellowship time, and then we'll get started in about 15 minutes with this uh, lunch uh, and teaching combination event going on right now. Secondly, this Friday night at 7 p.m. right here at Dallas Church, we are going to have a night of worship, of singing, of some scripture, and some good fellowship. So we want to invite you. You could bring a friend. Uh, come to Dallas Church this Friday night, the 18th at 7, for a night of worship. It's going to be great. So let's, uh, let's keep those couple things in mind and uh, go in and, and uh, uh, have some nice fellowship time together and be the church. Thank you so much. Powerful name it is. What a powerful name. 